Happy Monday, everyone. This is Martha with Nature Niche. And this week, um, I thought I'd, I'd start a two-part post uh, today focusing on how wild birds survive the winter. Maybe you've wondered this as you're um, huddled in the warmth of your home but enjoying your, your wild birds outside. So um, I'm going to focus on how they naturally survive our cold winter months this week. And then next week, I'll talk more about what we can do to help them through the harsh winter months. All different kinds of birds have special adaptations for living in cold climates. Uh, one thing that I didn't realize is that birds shiver. And unlike humans, where we, you know, just shiver a little bit, um, that's something that they do fairly consistently. Birds are like uh, little heat producing machines. They perform an isometric exercise where antagonistic uh, muscles work um, in opposition and that creates tension and produces heat. So this is something they can do without having to move around a lot and expose more of their body surface area to the chilly temps. I think it's amazing that they do this all winter um, and that's because um, birds have cells that are packed with mitochondria which um, help them increase their ATP production. This is an energy carrying molecule and um, helps them to uh, be able to consistently shiver and create heat. Birds can enhance their shivering capacity with bigger muscles. So we see um, an increase in the size of their flight muscles heading into winter by uh, up to 10 to 15%. So uh, you see a similar um, change in migratory birds, but the ones that are staying around with us all winter also increase the, their flight muscles and this helps create a bigger, more efficient furnace for shivering and creating warmth. Birds also eat a lot and have higher metabolic rates than humans do, uh, allowing them to burn energy and stay warm. And to do this, they need a steady supply of food. Little common red poles, for example, weigh less than 15 grams but they can survive uh, temperatures that dip almost 100 degrees below freezing. Pine siskins can do this as well. And black-capped chickadees weigh less than half an ounce and uh, they maintain their body temperature right around 100 degrees Fahrenheit, um, even when air temperatures reach zero degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and they eat more than 35% of their weight every day. Just to put that into perspective, Oreo, my 26 pound Cocker Spaniel, would have to eat more than nine pounds of food a day to keep up with that black cap chickadee. While I feel like she would try to do that, probably not good for her. Some birds can also slow down their metabolic rate to help conserve energy. For example, um, hummingbirds out on the, the west coast of the United States um, can do something called torpor, where they, they slow down their metabolism by as much as 95% to conserve energy during times of cold temperatures. Birds also cache food so that they have something to eat during very bad weather days where they don't want to um, venture out. And they have to remember where this food is cached. To learn more about caching in nature, check out Mondays with Martha number 33. Uh, chickadees are very good at this. They do something called scatter hoarding where um, they have multiple caches over a wide area and they use their memory to relocate them. Uh, feeder birds tend to have hundreds to a thousand or more caches over their territory, but chickadees can have up to 10,000 caches. 
And this is because their um, hippocampus, the part of the brain responsible for spatial memory, can increase in size in the fall and winter months by up to 30%. A group of birds known as corvids, which includes uh, blue jays, crows, ravens, and um, nutcrackers, have special body structures that aid them in their caching efforts. So blue jays, for example, have a distensible esophagus and they can carry two to three acorns in a pouch, uh, maybe another one in their mouth, plus maybe one more at the very tip of their bill to make them efficient cachers. Um, and crows and nutcrackers have a pouch um, either in front of or under their tongues to um, help them carry extra food items. And pine siskins can store up to 10% of their body mass in their crop, which is part of the esophagus. So um, they'll have enough energy to get them through about five to six nights of sub-zero temperatures by storing extra seed. Having extra body fat is also very important. Um, pecking on that body weight in late summer and fall when food items are more plentiful. Pine siskins are good at this. They put on half again as much winter fat uh, compared to their common red pole and American goldfinch relatives. And of course, feathers are very important to provide uh, very key insulation during these cold winter months. That's why you see the birds sitting with their feathers all fluffed up. Um, that creates air pockets that trap the body heat. And to do this, um, to the best of their ability, the feathers need to be clean and dry and flexible. So preening is the cleaning process uh, where they use oil from a gland at the base of their tail to um, help weatherproof their feathers. You can see that weatherproofing very nicely on these mallards where the water just beads up and rolls off. Some birds like egrets, herons, and morning doves grow specialized feathers that disintegrate into a powdery substance that's then used to waterproof their feathers. So that um, water resistant top layer is key to a nice warm inner feather layer. Certain species have very thick feathers. A good example um, would be snowy owls. They are true Arctic dwellers and they are our heaviest owl in North America, weighing in at about four pounds. And that's because they have very thick feathers that help insulate them from the cold. And another feather adaptation is having high feather density. Good example of this um, would be snow buntings, also Arctic dwellers and our northernmost songbird. Um, they have higher density feathers to help prevent heat loss especially at the base of their bills and their lower legs. And common red poles um, can put on 30% more feathers during the winter months, and that helps them to survive temperatures um, way down to the negative 65 degrees Fahrenheit, which is pretty amazing for these little birds. Birds also have um, a neat assortment of uh, behavioral, morphological, and physiological adaptations that help them conserve heat in their extremities. So they can tuck their feet, uh, sometimes stand on one leg, or lay down to cover their feet with feathers. They also tend to tuck their bills um, under their back feathers. This will help warm the bill, uh, decrease heat loss, and increase breathing efficiency um, as they're taking in the, the warmer wear air under the feathers. Their feet and legs are covered in scales that help minimize heat loss. Also, um, their feet and legs are uh, mostly tendon and bone with very little muscle and nerves, um, which helps them to tolerate lower foot temperatures. Uh, and then there's blood circulation. So species like gulls and ducks can stand um, on ice for long periods, be in cold water. And this is via a physiological concept known as regional heterothermy. And 
They're able to maintain their core body temperatures while allowing their extremities to be at lower temperatures than that core body temperature. Um, and they have a counter current heat exchange system, which is where cold blood in the veins coming up from their cold feet is warmed by the arterial blood flowing downward. Um, and this is possible by an intricate network of um, blood vessels um, in, their, in their feet and legs. This graphic is from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, and I'll, I'll drop a link um, to this particular website in the details of this post. A behavioral adaptation to surviving the winter is flocking or cuddling uh, when roosting. So many species flock up and hunker down together um, on shrubs and vine tangles like these cardinals are and in evergreen trees to help get out of the wind and share body heat. Uh, tree swallows are also very prone to doing this. Um, our cavity nesters like bluebirds, nuthatches, tufted titmice, and downy woodpeckers are known to huddle together inside uh, tree cavities. They'll also use man-made habitat structures. Um, and sometimes this is uh, in mixed species groups. And this both protects them from bad weather and from predators. Larger species like American crows, ring-billed gulls, geese, and swans also flock together for warmth. Other behavioral adaptations include uh, snow buntings, flop into snow drifts, making hollows for themselves, and the snow helps to insulate them from the um, cold and common red poles will tunnel into the snow to help stay warm uh, during the night. They are our most northern finch um, and they will even sometimes bathe in the snow. And species like cedar and bohemian waxwings and pine siskins will travel um, together and feed in flocks, uh, often following the leader to find the best feeding spots. Um, and increasing their chances of finding good food resources, working as a group. Of course, we have our typical migratory species like our ruby-throated hummingbirds, our Baltimore Orioles, and our rose-breasted grosbeaks that do true migration and just avoid the harsh winter weather altogether. This immature male rose-breasted grosbeak obviously didn't read the book. He was at my feeders uh, in early to mid-January a couple of years ago instead of being uh, down in Central and South America where he should have been with the rest of his family. And then there's eruptive migration behavior. Uh, this is especially true of some northern finch species like these um, evening grosbeaks. And sometimes due to winter food shortages and to avoid very inclement weather, um, those species will migrate um, into new areas where they aren't typically occurring every year. So some, sometimes that's moving south. Um, for other species, that's moving down um, from high elevations into lower elevations where it's warmer and into more protected valleys, as is the case with rosy finches. I hope this post helped you better understand how our wild birds survive the winter. Stay tuned for next week um, where I'll discuss what we can do to help them. Take care and stay warm.